Hi, I'm Aldo. Welcome to Plays The Thing, the channel where I share my experiences prepping and playing tabletop role-playing games. This video is a continuation of my gloaming campaign, which I, of course, am running using that dark fantasy role-playing game written by Kelsey Dion and published through her company, The Arcane Library, Shadow Dark. I am also running this using Kelsey's Curse Scroll number one, which gives us the setting that I am running this campaign in. And I have spiced it up by including the adventure, The Stargazer's Tower, which was written by James Raggy for his Lamentations of the Flame Princess game some time ago. It's a modified version of that that I sort of wove into what's been happening in our Gloaming campaign. As those of you who have been watching the channel for a while know, this has been an ongoing campaign. It's also one that has a little bit of a rotating cast. So let me go and take you to the folks who were able to show up and play today and their characters. So first up, we have Jason playing Renwick, the human wizard. We have Lauren playing Rowena, the human witch. We have Mario playing his brand new character, Benji, the halfling fighter. We have Dan playing his character, Ren, the bard. We have Andrew playing his character, Kraith the Warlock. And last but not least, we have Mike playing his character, Ursula, the half-orc fighter. Those of you who have been following the series for a while know that this group of characters was joined by several others in exploring the tower that they're currently in, but life is complicated and sometimes players can't make it. And so as is our practice in this game, we are letting the other characters kind of recede into the background. They're still there so they can step back in if the players can join us for the next session. But for now, this is a group of characters that are pushing forth with the actual adventure. So maybe a little bit of a recap is in order. Why is this party in this tower at this particular moment in time? The reason for that is that this group, which originated or at least, at least initially were headquartered in the town of Wardenwood, has taken on the mission to fight back against the demons that have been infiltrating and infesting this forest for almost a century now. And here is the region map that they are basically trying to save, trying to rid of these demons. Now, they were originally in Wardenwood, which I'm pinging right now on the map. They left the environs of Wardenwood and went out into the east hoping to find some lore having to do with the Green Knights, which were an order of knights that had originally fought against these demons way back when, about 100 years ago. They ended up going to Marin's Hold, and there they heard of Bittermold Keep, which was way up here across this big lake where I'm pinging now. So they made their way to Bittermold Keep. They spent quite some time there hoping to find something having to do with Green Knights. They were sorely disappointed in that, but they did pick up some lore there, some information there, some understanding there of the particular demon lord Mugdoblub that was operating out of Bittermold Keep. They also found Jakku the Polyglot, who was a ghost, the ghost of a wizard, who struck up a conversation and gave them a little bit of information, specifically having to do with an elf named Haldrin, who was a wizard that was running around these parts some 60 or 70 years ago. So they took all that in and they decided to return to Marin's hold, but they also decided that they were going to go and explore a tower that Rowena had seen peeking out of the tree line when the fisherman's ship that took them across the lake to Bittermold Keep had passed by the island. And so they decided since Bittermold Keep was a bust that they should explore this tower. They landed on the island after reprovisioning at Marin's Hold. They made their way to the island. They landed there and they had some nasty encounters with some demons. Um, they lost one of their longtime party members, Asher, who was Mario's original character. But they did manage to get into themselves into this tower. And they have slowly been piecing together that this tower was the home base of a wizard that was here about 100 years ago. 
And when they were exploring the tower, they found a journal that was left behind by Haldrin, the very wizard that, elven wizard that Jakku had told them about. So then they knew that this was a place of import in some way. And so when they read Haldrin's journal, they learned that Haldrin had actually sort of apprenticed himself to a human wizard who was willing to dabble in diablerie, which was sort of taboo for the elves to get in on. And so he was a young elf, got attached to this wizard named Orvalon Calcidius and started to learn about diablerie and stuff. And he was here as Calcidius sort of built this tower up and he built it up by summoning these servitors from the hells to come up and help him craft it. But then he kind of settled into exploring the cosmos with the telescope that he had mounted on it. And of course, it's not a normal telescope. It probes into secret corners of the universe, not necessarily just space as we know it. But as Calcidius settled into this study, he started to become more and more unhinged. And Haldrin, according to the journal that they read, had decided that he would trap him and then flee. So they had learned that much. Right after learning that, they had gone up some stairs, found a door that was kind of magic locked. And when they looked through the keyhole, they saw who they assumed to be Calcidius in kind of an energy bubble in there somewhere. Renwick tried to establish mental contact with him and couldn't. So he told Ishza, their goblin thief, to pick the lock, even though she could sense that something potentially bad would happen if she opened the door in that way. But she did it, and the door exploded open, and blood drenched everybody. This kind of like impossible gout of blood shot out, knocking almost everybody down the stairs. And that's where we kind of left off last time. So... Now let's go through what happened in this particular session. Once they all picked themselves off the floor, they started to walk into this room that they had opened. The entire level of this tower was taken up essentially by this bedroom and it was Calcidius's bedroom. Calcidius, like I said, was encased in this dome of energy, which was anchored to the floor by a ring of salt, a thick ring of salt. Immediately, Renwick recognized that if you disturb that salt, that Calcidius could be set free. So he cautioned the others not to do that. They also saw a couple of stands right next to where Calcidius was standing. One of them held a gem kind of shaped like an egg, this kind of flawless large gem shaped like an egg. And there was another stand kind of opposite of it that was similar, but didn't hold a gem like the other one did. There was also a kind of sliding metal door to the right of the chamber. And then there was some furniture that was all kind of like in bad state, just very old and kind of rotting. The character started to file into the room. Calcidius, for his part, played nice. He was thankful that they got there and he was encouraging them to please just remove the salt and let him out. I'm not going to dwell too much on how that went. Renwick was kind of evasive at first and making up excuses as to why they should not and saying, what reason do we have to trust you? And then Calcidius just erupted in a rage and demanded that he be let free, at which point Renwick said, thank you for confirming what I already knew, that we can't let you out. Calcidius kept saying that he was going to rack their souls in hell and when they got out that he would never forget this, but they basically ignored him to the best of their ability, even though he kept ranting the whole rest of the time that we're in the room. In the meantime, Benji walked into the room and he saw that egg-shaped gem and he was instantly drawn to it, right? This was Mario's doing, playing Benji. I didn't have make a role to be drawn to it. His greed or his desire for something nice got the better of him and he went up and he took it. There was no reaction to it, so he ended up putting in his sack. They searched the room for other things. They found a book on exploring different planes of existence. So they pocketed that. With that, they turned their attention to that metal door that was to the right side of the chamber. This was satisfying for them because as long as they'd been in the tower, they had been 
wondering why that side of the tower didn't reveal its curvature from the inside. In other words, they thought there were secret doors or something on that side of the tower that they had not been able to find because they realized that the shape of the tower wasn't fully being expressed on that side from the from the inside. So here they found out why. When they opened that metal door, they saw that there was a shaft that went straight up. They saw that there was a metal disc that was just hovering in place. And they, they saw that there was a dial that had numbers on it. The numbers were from top to bottom, five, four, three, and then one, and two, they quickly realized that this was some sort of magical elevator and they began to experiment with it. Now, only two people could step into the elevator at once. So Kraith and Ren decided that they would do it first. They went in, they lit a torch, and then they decided to hit level one. So they turned the dial to level one and it shot down a pretty long way. They were a little surprised by how far down it went. It seemed to them that it went further down than the levels that they had already explored. And it ended up in a chamber to the right and to the left of them was a bunch of machinery, kind of like naked machinery, right? Not hidden by any walls or any barriers or anything like that. And then it seemed to open up into this chamber that had some grotesqueries in it, right? There were tables where there were these bodies of animals and people that looked like they had been desiccated and stitched together in different ways. There were several doors leading, you know, to the west and to the south and then a hallway up to the north, but they decided that they weren't going to explore that on their own. Kraith decided to remain down there um, with a torch guarding. He, did, he wasn't going to step in and actually study anything while Ren went back up and told the others. So then Ren started to experiment with the knobs and she actually couldn't figure out which knob took her back to the level where she was. So in the process, she ended up exploring all the levels. When she went to level two, it actually took her down and she ended up in a room that had all these weird barriers made of like a bluish energy and beyond the barriers at the very, very edge of her light, because she had lit another torch, she could see that there were treasure chests that seemed to be behind those barriers. So then she put it up to five and she went all the way back, all the way up to the top of the tower. And she saw a dome with a lens sticking out of it. And she saw the metallic vault of the tower, which had these blue metal plates that were kind of surrounding the whole vault of the tower. And she saw that there was like a, a strange pool of, of water off to the side. And there were some big metal kind of containers off to the side as well. She didn't get off to explore that. She just kind of held up her torch, caught all of that. She hit the knob again and she shot down to a level where the doors open and she saw that there was this kind of like reading room with like a long desk set up with some books lying on the desk and chairs surrounding, not really a desk, kind of like a long table with chairs all around it and some doors leading in and out. There was also a door at that level. There was a door that went west and again, she didn't get out. She hit three and she went back to where everybody else was waiting and everybody else had seen her kind of shoot up and then they heard the disc hovering up there and stuff like that. So they were all kind of like arms crossed waiting for her to come down to her level and she told them what she had seen. So at that point, they decided that they would go down and join Kraith on level one. They went down one at a time or two at a time and they all filed into the room with all of the grotesqueries, all of the corpses and the bodies stitched together. While he was waiting, Kraith had actually gotten a little bit curious and he walked over to one of the tables and he saw what I described without using the word microscope, right? But he basically saw a microscope and he saw that there were the glass slides where you smear blood. He saw that there was some blood smeared on those. He didn't know what it was. So he just kind of backed off and waited for the others to get here. So then when everybody got down, they started to experiment and they started to look around. They were very cautious about approaching the corpses. They kind of went over and looked at the corpses and were like, hmm. Okay, whatever. Kraith called Renwick over to the microscope and Renwick went over and he kind of played around with it. He put one of the samples in, took a look. I had to make a roll and he was able to determine that it was 
demon blood. He also opened up a thing that was on the table where the microscope was, like a little box, and he saw that there were stoppered test tubes, essentially, filled with blood. So he just closed that and left it there. In the meanwhile, Ren and Ursula, I think it was, had gone up to the passage. It was to the north of this chamber in the northern part of the of the room. And they noticed that there were a bunch of mirrors there. And so they called Renwick over and they said, hey, mirrors, you know about magic stuff. This is a wizard's tower. What do you think? What's up with these? Renwick decided that he was going to go and take a look. He looked into one of the mirrors and he had to make a saving throw. And he made it. And what he saw in the mirror was an idealized version of himself. And then that manifested in a boost, permanent boost, to several of his of his attributes. Rowena at that point came over and she was like, Renwick? And then Renwick turned around and there was like a visible difference. His strength had gone up a little bit. I think his charisma had gone up a little bit. He looked better. He looked more sure. And she was like, there's something about you. What is this? And he's like, hmm. This is curious, you know? So he decided to try his luck at a different mirror. Ren, at this point, was starting to get curious. And she was, like, thinking that she might go and look in a mirror as well. Rowena was telling them to be careful. She didn't trust it. Ren and Renwick did both look into other mirrors. And unfortunately, this time, they both failed their roles. Rowena saw herself old. And some of her stats went down. She's lucky. I rolled the minimum that she could lose. It could have been really bad. She felt, you know, like the age kind of creep in. I don't remember if Dan said that she had any gray permanently appear on her head. She didn't look elderly when she disengaged, but it definitely took a toll on her. As for Renwick, when he looked into his mirror, he saw this endless succession of reflections of himself and he saw them all trying to work out a problem, the same problem. And there were too many of him making too many choices and he got kind of lost in the cacophony of it. And the others saw that he went catatonic. So as Ren pulled back, kind of like weakened, you know, Renwick was kind of stuck catatonic and um, Ursula and Rowena like pulled him away and he kind of like lost consciousness. Rowena went over to him and brought him back. And like so many times has been the case, Renwick's eyes opened to see Rowena. You know, normally when he sees Rowena, he gets a sense of like peace and she's like his good luck kind of token. But this time he looked at her and he couldn't shake this feeling of despair. Like he couldn't solve a problem that he was almost doomed to fail at solving a problem. And it was very unsettling for him. As this was happening, they heard the crashing of mirrors because Ursula went in with her axe and just laid waste to the mirrors, shattering them all. They all kind of picked themselves up from this and pulled away from that part of the room and decided that they would search the southern side of the chamber where there was another door there. They opened the door and stepped into what looked like this long, long line of cells. Like it's obvious that this is where a lot of the people or animals that were experimented on here were probably kept. And the moment they opened it and stepped into the hallway, there was this cry of voices saying kind of like free me free me and these floating kind of ghosts came out with with despair and anguish in their faces and kind of like launched themselves at them and the the characters were able to fight off some of them and then they backed away from the chamber and they closed the door and the creatures did not follow them into the hall so they ended up finishing off this level by exploring the chamber that was to the west. And there they found it was basically a, uh, a warehouse area, like a storage area filled with crates. And when they started opening the crates, it was just really grotesque. It was like bones that were kind of arrayed in different kind of positions and cataloged in different ways. And each one had the name and some biographical details of the person that they were taken from. So obviously, assuming this is Urvalon Calcidius, you know, his mind had taken some sort of sharp turn towards crazy and evil due to his encounters with demons, one would assume. The party was left kind of feeling very shaken by what they'd seen down here. 
And they were also a little bit beat up in, in various different ways. They decided, you know, there were some missed spell rolls here and there, and they'd taken some damage from the creatures that had launched out of the cells and all of that. So they decided that they were going to rest. And they did. They took a long rest in the warehouse, actually, as creepy as that place was. But they felt that it was a kind of a defensible place. And they kind of slept uneasily. But after they were all healed up, they decided to go and explore the rest of the tower. They went back to the elevator and they all chose level four, which is the level right above Calcidius's room. And when everybody got up there, they went in and they realized that what they were looking at was essentially a library. You know, the, the chamber that Ren had seen was a, um, a reading area, but the doors that went to the northern part of this chamber opened into this large library and Ren and Rowena in particular went in and started picking through it at first. Ursula and Renwick went into the chamber to the western part of the room and uh, Kraith went into the section to the east. The elevator had two doors, one that led into the library and one that led to the to the east. So that's where they all split up. As far as Kraith is concerned, it was a refrigerated room with a refrigerated box. And when he opened it up, he saw that there was frozen blood in test tubes. Didn't mess with that. Closed it. Went to report to Renwick what he found. Rowena and Ren, and I think Benji went with them as well, found books on machinery, like pretty fine machinery. They found books on glass, including the making of lenses and things like that. And they found a section that was kind of like a fiction section, but everything had to do with kind of otherworldly planes and that sort of thing. But most of it was mundane. They were kind of like advanced subject or subjects or esoteric subjects, but none of them were scrolls with spells on them or things like that. So they did that and Rowena was like, eh, show me something interesting. For his part, Renwick and I think it was Ursula went into the chamber next door. And when they were there, there was kind of like a sitting area with a door that led to the southern part of the chamber. And a ghost appeared at this desk that was in the sitting area. And there was a chess game that was set up in front of him. And he said, would anybody chance their soul in a game to get access to the library? They had some interactions with him and decided, no, they were not going to do that. Actually, I just remembered I made a mistake. Ursula is the one that found the blood bottles. It was Kraith who went with Renwick. And the reason I just remembered that is because when they were having a conversation with the ghost and he, he offered to give up his soul, Renwick was like, haven't you already given up your soul to a demon? So you don't really have a soul. So maybe you can play the game. Maybe it's a loophole. And Kraith was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to be giving away something that's owed to the Willow Man. I'm not going to do that. Renwick was like, okay, just a thought. And so they backed away and the ghost looked disappointed and he kind of like vanished. So then they all kind of gathered again in the sitting room area and they were like, well, we still have to go upstairs. They all went in to the elevator two at a time. They came up to the top floor and there they found this dome with, with a lens sticking out of it, which we know is a telescope, right? They found a series of levers inside the telescope. They found that strange still pool off to the side. And when they went and looked at it more closely, they saw that there were these weird alien looking fish, right? Like nothing they'd ever seen before. And they were swimming around in this pool and Ursula took a spear and speared one of them and it died. And then all the other fish started like going into a swimming pattern around it. And they started, it almost looked like they were dancing and circling the fish. And then they started kind of like after a while of doing that, they started like diving in and like biting it, but it was like in a very almost ritualistic kind of way. At least it seemed to them that, that was the case. So they were kind of like weirded out by that. And then some of the others went to the bins, those like metallic bins that were off to the side of, of the other side of the room. And when they, when they peeked in, they saw that they were filled with coal. One of them was filled with, with gunpowder. And while all that was going on, Rowena and Renwick had gone into the telescope itself, the dome that held a seat that Renwick sat in and Rowena stood behind him. There were these switches in there and Renwick hit them in order. And 
what happened was that the first one started to retract the roof and it started to open up to the heavens and it was like a massive storm outside and there was lightning that was like arcing across the sky and lightning that was arcing to hit these kind of like curved spires that I had described in the first session that were up here and so the they were acting like lightning rods but you know it was powerful and scary right everybody that was up there was like opened up to rain coming in and this lightning flashing all around them and stuff the second switch ended up extending the telescope another one opened the lens those that were standing outside noticed that in front of the lens there was like a an egg-shaped kind of a ring that was part of the whole mechanism and they immediately realized oh if we put that gem that we found in there it would probably hold it and then when Renwick hit the last thing the whole thing started to kind of like grind and shake and and kind of sputter and so he turned it off and then he ended up like closing everything off again he got out to walk around the perimeter of the dome to see if he could find out what was causing that sputtering to happen but he didn't immediately figure out what it was at this point they got into a discussion as to what it is that they should be doing renwick was like this is it i'm convinced that something about this tower and something about this telescope is intrinsically tied to what's happening with these demons and if we can shut down this whole device we might be able to prevent the demons from coming back into our plane so i think we need to rest and think and figure out what our plan is going to be ren reminded him that there was a room in the bottom that they had not explored yet that's the one with the weird energy walls or barriers that were separating them from some treasure chests and then of course they have not explored the library either the one that the ghost is guarding so with that we were running out of time so i said okay um you have things that you want to do next time so let's figure out what that's going to be and we close down for the night so that's it i think that we are coming close to the end of this campaign the adventure as written the setting as written by kelsey in curse scrolls number one does not have an ending of sorts a shutting down of the demon situation it just doesn't mention that at all it, it gives a lot of things you know a lot of encounters and it gives a very detailed situation in terms of bitter mold keep but as we've been playing i've kind of figured out what happened here it just so happens that i made a long time ago you know early on in the campaign i decided that this tower was going to kind of be uh important to all of that and once i found the stargazers tower as an adventure and slotted it in as the situation that was there for them to encounter and i linked it to everything else that i knew about the campaign i knew what the potential for this was and it's interesting because they almost backed out after losing asher a couple of sessions ago when they got to the foot of this tower they took a vote right two of them voted against going into the tower so they would have gone back to the shore gotten back on a boat and gone back to do something else and walked away from this but they didn't do that so because of that it could be that this adventure will end in one or two sessions and that along with the adventure of the tower that maybe maybe it will also be the end of the campaign i'm not 100 percent sure yet because i can see a couple of ways in which this can go which might keep us playing it for a little while longer but if it does end i think it'll be a good end and um then we will you know move on to a different shadow dark game because it really has become kind of our baseline game that we play along with some of the other superhero games that we play. But again, the, the common denominator for my group tends to be fantasy. At least it has been historically like the, the largest number of our party can agree on fantasy and shadow dark has been our fantasy game of choice. So it is very likely that we will play another game of shadow dark after we finish this one. So anyway, that's for the future. If you stayed around to this point, thank you again. As always, I wish you good health, I wish you good cheer, I wish you good gaming, and goodbye.